afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Robert T. Green. I'm the CEO of Pre Post Game, also known as the Players Rep, here to educate and empower, protect the athlete and the family's best interests alone. Today is Wednesday, uh, April the 18th. And once again, we're joined here for the Pre Post Game podcast, sponsored by the African American Athlete, hosted by Mr. Michael Robinson and Mr. Ricky Hampton. Uh, definitely tune in, check them out on Tuesday nights from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'm really looking forward to today's show. Um, covering some things because uh, as the players rep, before I go any further, I just find that, you know, being in the sports business, working with athletes and their families, and then talking to fans, it is people that uh, are around athletes, that athletes mean so many different things to so many different people that literally that's what pretty what the problem is, is that people don't know what an athlete actually is, what they do, um, what their value might be, and how, in essence, they need to be treated as such. Um, because these are kids for most times or parents that in situations where they don't have the resources or the knowledge, um, anybody and anyone or anything basically takes advantage of them. And here we're trying to educate and empower, protect and make sure that doesn't happen. So, again, this is an interactive show. We're here every Wednesday, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have questions, please try to um, post them in the comments section in the box, and I will try to answer them as best I can. Um, normally, Mr. Ricky Hampton is also on the other end. He'll get your questions. If not, um, like I said, again, leave them in the inbox or in the comment section. We'll try to go from there. So um, once again, if you want to follow us, check us out. You can follow me here at the Players Rep on Facebook. You can check us out at prepostgame.com. It's on the actual um, pinned. So again, you can go to pre-postgame.com. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter, the Players Rep 1, and on Instagram, the Players Rep 1. So um, tonight's show, first topic, like I said, again, I was thinking about how athletes mean a lot of different things, a lot of different people. And I just wanted to just try to figure out and the best way I can to educate people about what an athlete really does and consists of one of the major things regarding the NCAA and how things go where um, are they going to get paid or not? And that's always seems to be the question. And people want to talk about free education, um, how they basically have a, hunch, a bunch of you know money in their school loans and how athletes are treated a certain way and why they shouldn't be paid. And you got the people that say they should be paid. And, and, it, and it just goes on and on and on. The reality is, again, like anything else, when you go to your job or, or, or place of employment, um, when you go and provide a service for that job, no matter what that job may be, at the end of that week or that month or whatever your pay rate or scale is, they provide you with compensation for your actual services. Um, when you got that job and services, you understood that you were going to get compensated for that. So no matter how good you did or how happy you were when you went there, they're going to say, hey, your name is on a check. This is what you get for that. And that will be your compensation. So, again, when you talk about free education, go back to the beginning. When you assign an agreement in a contract, and I'm going to read what an employee is from the business dictionary term. An employee is an individual who works part time or full time under a contract of employment, whether oral or written express or implied as has recognized rights and duties also called a worker. If anyone does not think that athletes are workers or don't do certain things, when we know they're under contract, starting with the National Letter of Intent, also known as NLI, also your scholarship paperwork. It's also a lot of other things that literally when you talk about full scholarship, that doesn't apply to every single person. It's like a person that's an actual student athlete or just a student in general. When you buy your books and at the end of the year, you can sell your books back to the next person. The athlete is not allowed to sell their books. Not only are they not allowed to sell their books, but the majority of the time, the books that they receive are hand-me-downs from other athletes that were donated from there. So once again, when you say full scholarship, you, you make it out to seem so glorious and so over the top that these athletes are getting things that – a normal student gets, when in essence, the normal student gets better books than the actual athlete does. They also attend better classes from a long-term longevity standpoint, from a degree standpoint, than the athlete does. And also, at the end of the day, that athlete and that student, that student in general, is not putting their body on the line to actually go through things that most um, student athletes or most athletes and most students wouldn't do in general. So that's what an employee does. So from an athlete's perspective, if you look to the to the to the actual um, the post that said athletes are many things to too many people. For one, look at the actual um, breakdown where it's like, okay, what does an athlete mean to you? So what do people want to be around athletes for? So one, they want to be around an athlete. They want to watch athletes. They want to coach the athlete. They want to scout the athlete. They want to recruit the athlete. They also bet on the athlete. They want to interview the athlete. They want to work for the athlete, work with the athlete. They want to exploit the athlete. They want to be an agent of the athlete. 
They want to be an advisor of the athlete. They want to be a mentor of the athlete. They want to hang out with the athlete. They want to be the circle of influence of the athlete. They want to get paid by the athlete. They want to get paid because of the athlete. And at the end of the day, they also want to critique the decisions of the athlete. And that's everyone wants to do that for a fee, that is. But very few people want to advocate for the rights of the athlete or even know or understand the needs of the athlete. But what's a fact of the matter is that no one wants to pay the athlete, even though they're generating all the revenue. No one wants to pay the athlete. So once again, let's take this equation and flip it back to what you do day to day for a living. So let everybody be around you. Let everybody talk to you, hang out with you, figure out what you know. Take your knowledge, use it to make themselves money, and then turn around and don't want to pay you for your services. They don't want to say that you know what you worked hard for this money. You don't want to say you want to put that you're the reason why this thing is generating. You're not the reason why this was a good sales day. They don't want to do any of that. They don't even want to ask you why you feel like you should be paid. They just want to say that you shouldn't be paid. But yet we're talking about 17, 16, 15 up to 20-year-old men and women that literally do not have a voice in this space. That's why I'm the player trip. That's what we're here to do, to educate and empower, protect their best interests and their families and their best interests alone. But again, I can't think of one person that goes to work tomorrow that wants to take that, that, that result. Or maybe your job can tell you, hey, you know what? Don't worry about working today. We're going to send you to the library. We're going to send you over to this training facility, and we're gonna, you're going to learn a little bit. We're going to teach you, uh, update this new data. But by the way, when you learn this data, we're not going to pay you this week. Because, um, again, you just got educated. Well, did you have a choice? Did they ask you? Because a, a kid is 15, 16 year old, and at the end of the day, if it was about free education, they would not have these kids under contract. Once again, when I go to university and the school and I talk about what I want to do for a living and how I'm going to do it, I should have my input in it. My family should be involved in it because this is our decision and our lives. There's 700 universities or schools, if you will, and colleges that play football and they get compensation for it through ticket sales, market, merchandising, advertising, um, or ticket sales from the gate. At the end of the day, there's not one parent that they bring into an office at the NCAA headquarters, university, say, hey, what can we do to basically make your life better for your son and your daughter regarding their experience in college? It's a phrase you talk about, tell you what you want to know, but not what you need to hear. That's, that's a common theme when it comes to athletes who don't understand. Again, so from that standpoint in general, what does sports mean to people? What do they mean to you? I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious to know. Most people regarding sports don't really understand what goes into the sport. You know, NBA playoffs are going on right now, and, and you know, you got, um, you know, was it eight teams or each conference, and they're playing, and everybody has a comment or an idea um, what should happen or not happen. You know, one week, game one, Philly versus Miami. Miami, I mean, Philly came out as gangbusters, and everybody said Philly is back and had AI in the building. And then all of a sudden you, you play game two, and then Dwayne Wade uh, has a reoccurrence, and now he's called the flash again. Um, and then all of a sudden now it's back to, you know, one and one. Who really benefits from that? You know, obviously it's a good series, but from a fan base standpoint, from the NBA standpoint, from a media market and money generating standpoint, it's perfect because now you have suspense. You have, I don't know, you have people that were on the fence. For example, if Miami Wolves go down 0-2 um, after the second game, then literally, you know, people will be like, well, I'm really not going to waste my money to go uh, watch them play in Miami because um, they're not going to make it to the next round. You know, so sports in general, for what that means to the team in the league is that for them, it means money. It means like, hey, we're getting paid. But as a fan, what does it mean to you? Is it is it about um, entertainment, camaraderie? Is it about excitement? Is it about uh, wanting to see these kids excel? Is it your fandom? Um, Mr. Hampton, I know. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Honestly, I can't I can't see your uh, comments. They blocked out for whatever reason. Um, I see there's three comments, but let me see if I can. Um... Oh, there we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. What about the kid that plays four years of college football, suffers an injury that requires attention beyond his eligibility? NBA's going to get their teams in the finals. Um, so, again, that question you're talking about, the kid that plays four years, again, he's not going to get any type of um, support beyond his four years in college. Once again, when you're in school, you get a, a certain amount of time to get, you know, your, your, goal, your schooling in. You get five years to play for, particularly when it comes to the NCAA and the scholarships. You get um, – an opportunity to get injured to basically get one medical red shirt. Sometimes you get two 
in an extreme circumstance. But even then, the documentation, the paperwork has to be filled out correctly. And then the treatment that you get for the actual injury is pretty much to get you back to um, walking or just able to be mobile uh, shape. It's not necessarily saying that they're trying to get you back to be at the next level to play professionally. And I'm going to cover that um, in a minute about why um, all athletes think they're going pro or how that actually works. So, uh, again, the NBA, like I said, what sports mean to people is particularly like, you know, no matter what the team or where they come from, there's always someone out there that has an idea why they should basically be able to um, tell an athlete, no matter what age, what they should be doing. Um, and, again, on, on that first soliloquy in the beginning, I talk about the critique, the decision of the athlete. But like I said, there's so many different things that an athlete means to so many different people that it's almost impossible for them to basically get what they need and what they want because, once again, everybody wants something from them. Like I said, whether it's in Vegas or the gambling, whether it's the, the 247 scout or all these other scouting sites or these showcase people, that's what they want for. Again, the people that want to be a circle of the influence. And what you have is now an athlete trying to appease or basically – um, be someone to all of them in order to make them happy. And again, I'm the first proponent to tell you that sports is not a game. It's all business. The athlete must learn. The parents must learn to invest in yourself, not the industry. Uh, at the end of the day, the industry is going to still be there. The same runners, the same advisors, the same mentors, the same um, teams and things like that are going to be there when the athlete's no longer there. So you must maximize your opportunity. Like I said, when you go to work this week or next week, does you have, do you have an actual expiration date based off your age or based off of your um, athletic ability to maintain your employment? Um, the answer is no. But when it comes to the athlete, whether it's in school or not, even with the free education, if the athlete doesn't maintain a certain type of play on that field, that scholarship based off the rules that's in place can be taken from them, no matter how hard they work, no matter how good of a person that they are. You heard Herm Edwards a couple weeks ago said that he's going to cut scholarships, which is a great point. Again, I think Mr. Edwards was saying that because at the end of the day, he is basically solidifying our position that sports is not a game. It's all business. It's not about education. The fact of the matter is that in, in, in college, you have pretty much 85 maximized, max, maximal scholarships, full scholarships you can use in football in particular, and 13 in basketball, full scholarships. But in football, out of the 85, you also have another 15 preferred walk-ons um, that actually play for your actual team. So what that means essentially is that we talk about football, only 22 guys play at a time. 22 guys, but you have a roster of 100. So you, you, all those guys are not going to get on the field. So, again, you're talking about a 501c3 NCAA that gets money and also the universities. They get money for each one of these students, whether it's through financial aid. Again, what a scholarship technically is, is an actual donation, a lot of times from boosters. Up to 2018 tax reform, people used to go buy tickets, season tickets to their actual favorite college event and put money back into the university and then would write that off as a deduction. Um, with the new tax reforms, that actual benefit is, has been removed from that standpoint. So when people think that these athletes are getting some type of um, glorious uh, money or Living a life, once again, you talk about the actual 20-hour rule. The 20-hour rule means that the athlete is supposed to commit 20 hours a week or the, the team athletic program can commit no more than 20 hours a week, then, then, then they got to go to class. But the fact of the matter is a thing called a captain and team leaders. Once again, these coaches put these things in these kids' heads. And, for example, if you go look at any university, any type of athletic program right now, let's take basketball, for example. All these basketball gyms that's inside of their schools now have what they have it's a, a, a circle. So the court's in the middle. Then their office is all the way around the actual um, gym. There's cameras everywhere. And they also, a lot of the gyms have your thumbprints. You go put your thumbprint in. So even after you, um, you know, get your 20 hours a week in with the coaches, what you're allowed to do, they sit there and watch. They watch you to see if you're going to be working out more than that. And a lot of times, these are like 45 to 50 hour weeks. And again, there's a lot of coaches that would tell athletes to their face, I being one, that you're not here to play uh, to go to class, you're here to um, play a sport. And in essence, playing that sport is what getting that coach paid. So when people continue to say that it's about education, knowing blatantly that those inside this industry telling those actual kids that they're not here to go to school, but yet people still don't support them in getting these things done. Um, we had a sad state of affairs in this country. As an African-American athlete and a CEO of a company, a homeowner, a business owner, someone that advocates and works with millionaires and people that are uh, penny heirs, if that's the word, <laughs> excuse me with that. But at the same time, it's like knowing where they are, meeting them where they are, to help them get to where they want to be 
is where these things are missing when it comes to athletes. No one is asking them what they want, what they need, or how they can feel like they can go about these things. They're all telling them. And in essence, go back again. If they're not employees and they're being told what to do, mind you, again, they're being told what to do, then what do you call that? Now, for some of the people that like, don't realize, like, you know, those things were abolished years ago. And that's the problem. We're going backwards when it comes to these things. The money from 2018 in sports is getting, going up, up, up. And at the same time, we're not actually making any difference regarding how these athletes start to see themselves moving in certain directions. You got to figure this out. And like I said, at the end of the day, the only one that really can figure out and make a change is the actual parent and the actual athlete. They're the ones that got to put their signature on the actual contract. My company in particular, working along with some other attorneys and, and, and other um, companies are saying like, hey, don't sign anything till you had it reviewed and understand what it means. Perfect example. There's a lot of contracts right now going on in the National Football League before the draft come up that had the term perpetuity in it. Now, again, that may be a common word to you or me or anybody that's, you know, knowledgeable of the English dictionary. But when you talk about a 17 to 20 year old kid, they have no idea what perpetuity means. You might find that in a couple sentences here and there. And to be sure that they even sometimes their own agents skip that word. And for those who know perpetuity mean, it means for life, forever. So you talk about marketing or something that, again, you talk about likeness and image and things like that. You put perpetuity in it, and then at the end of the day, you sign it. It could be the NCAA. It could be your agent. It could be somebody at your high school. You gave them the right to use your likeness and image forever for a monetary value. That doesn't make any sense. So, again, we get it that these kids are not going to understand some of these things, but they need to get all this stuff audited. They need to get it verified, and they need to basically address those that put this stuff in front of them and literally say, hey, what do you, what do you think I am? Because at the end of the day, if it wasn't that important, um, this documentation, they wouldn't have you signing it. They also, if it wasn't that important, they wouldn't stay, wait six months of running you around the country through social media and graphics and going to the games and throwing up the glove and doing all that stuff you do with the signs. And again, at the end of the day, when it's time to actually look this documentation over, they don't have time for that. They want you to sign it, they put you in the room, they stand over you like you and being interrogated, like you just got locked up or something, and they say sign it. Those days have to come to an end. They have to, they have to come to an end. Because the bottom line is this, you know, people don't know, because, again, the main media won't talk about it, but um, there's a, a possibility that the NCAA transfer rules are about to change. Not all the way through, but as a proponent of athletes and, the, and an advocate of athletes, it will be a huge win. And that change will be that um, right now, currently, as you know, coaches can lie to a kid, which they do often, and known by the NCAA. That's the point. It's actually known. They actually – advise them not to tell the kid and the family that he's going to take another job before he gets his letter signed. So again, you okay with recruiting a kid for six months, coaches, and then know you take another job because you got that five-star kid to go somewhere else. You're okay NCAA by saying, don't tell him. And then at the end of the day, now you can go make millions, but that kid is now stuck there and he might not be a good fit for that school or that coach. And then he has to basically not be able to transfer because his coach will say, well, you know what? No, I don't want you to go. So the rule is looking to change is that literally once that coach does leave and that kid is lied to or manipulated or misrepresented by this university, that kid will be able to transfer. However, he still at this point will have to be able to sit out still another year. But at the end of the day, it's a big step uh, or it's a small step in a big situation. And I like to think that we are working hard and diligently to actually make sure that the athlete's rights are advocated for. Now, with, well, Although a minute change, the biggest difference is that it's going to basically start to hold some of these coaches accountable in regarding what they say to these kids. As I said before, anybody says something to you that a promise that be made, they must be willing to put it in writing. Just like you go to any other uh, doctor's appointment. When you go to get a doctor, a, a checkup or go see a dentist, before they put you in that chair, they ask you for your insurance card, maybe sometimes something else, your copay, and then you get the service. At the end of the day, nobody's going there and saying, you know what, I'm going to pay that when um, you guys finish this. Real-world business-like situation don't work that way. We want to talk about education, but everything that these young men and these families are doing regarding this process is completely uneducated. It makes absolutely no sense. It never has. At the end of the day, there are also coaches in this scenario that aren't there to educate these kids. They are there to use these kids to make money. So then you're talking about kids that are impressionable that's now in a situation where that the one side is saying they need to get an education 
even though that education is being told to them what it's going to be, not something they want to do or passionate about. Anybody else is doing something that they're not, they don't want to do and they're not passionate about and, and, and it's been successful. You may get through it, but you're not running around and playing 10 to 12 hours of a sport a day and then go think you're going to read some book and then come up with an A in your test. See, people look at movies such as like the program or um, any given Sunday and, and laugh at it like, oh, when when Mr. Matt, Matt couldn't read, but he can sound, he said he could spell Nike. That, we're not too far off from where that was. That movie was made in 1993. There's still athletes that only can read their playbook because some of the classes they've been put in has nothing to do with reading. Abstract art, swimming, the backstroke, the best stroke, whatever stroke they're going to do. And then you're talking about they're going to get an education. When you're talking about the NFL and NBA draft right now, where I was looking at Marquez Fultz's contract from last year, because, again, everything regarding um, contracts in America and the rookie contract, whether it's in the four major sports, Major League Baseball, MLB, uh, NBA, National Basketball Association, NFL, National Football League, and the NHL, National Hockey League, all of them have a what they call a rookie wage scale. And all the rookie wage scale is basically telling you exactly what you're going to get. So regardless of the fact, so again, we're talking about football, which is a contact sport, where now their CBA, or their collective bargain, their players association, somehow, some way in a, in a sport where their contracts aren't guaranteed, pushed to a four-year with a fifth-year option. Once again, we're going back to the last week's show. I'm a football player. I got to basically be able to be dominant or successful on the field a certain amount of time remaining injury-free in a contact sport. So you're going to, in my best years, you're going to basically, after you got all this free marketing and advertisements in the NCAA, when they made all the money off of me, and now you're going to get me for four to five years, where in the NBA, which again, obviously is not a contact sport as much as football, and the careers are longer, but their first year contract is two years. And the thing about them, they have less players getting drafted. So you have less players getting drafted, and you only have two-year contracts. We know which league and which industry is basically working towards or working on behalf of the players. Because, again, the players generate the revenue. It's not the other way around. But once again, when you get hit in the head every day, you're running around, you you just just loud and just, you know, being rah, rah, rah. And these coaches and these people around you want to tell you things that you want to hit but not what you need to know. It becomes a situation like it doesn't make any sense. Again, for those people who don't know, my company is, again, I'm a sports business management and advisory firm for athletes. We provide transition succession plan. We also mentor. So when I'm saying I'm well aware of a lot of situations currently, again, that I never disclose because, again, that's my job to protect the anonymity of our clients. But I do talk sometimes on, on this podcast about factual situations. And one of those situations I want to talk about is how some of these universities set these kids up for failure. For example, kids are going to be kids. So whether they're smoking weed, they're hanging out with females, whether they uh, cut class, whether they do any of these things like that, you would think that this so-called education is being provided by the actual university to say, hey, you know what, this is what you shouldn't do because this was what happened to athletes like you in the past more of a nurturing type of, hey, that's real education. That's, that's character development. That's life changing. But you can't do that when some of your coaches are doing the same exact thing and worse, but at the same time, you don't hear that on TV because the schools cover that up. They push the players right out to the front. Tell the players, don't say nothing to worry about it. Let it, let it lay low. You got coaches that leave and the new coaches come in and the same parents that got recruited by those other coaches, they never even called to say to the parent, like, hey, I'm such and such coach. I'm going to take care of your son make sure they get the degree that we said we're going to help them get, get the education, that free education. None of that. They're more interested in talking about they have a relationship with Migos or this rapper or that rapper so they can go around and cohort another kid to sign something he can't read either. I've become real disappointed in adults when it comes to the actual adv advocacy of these actual athletes because, once again, I know what TV portrays, I know what the media portrays, and I know what people believe because at the end of the day, this is, this, this is facts. Everybody can't play sports at the level that these athletes do. It's not that simple. If they could, everybody would. And if everybody could, they would basically give everybody free scholarships and they could be whatever. 
But there's kids out there and former players out there that love sports to watch the sport. But if they even attempted to step on the court or the field or in the ring with any of these other athletes, that would be the worst mistake they ever made. They will realize, I can't do what they do. This is amazing. Wow. One day in the weight room, one practice, one nutcracker, one Oklahoma drill, 140 when your chest is about to explode. This is work. This is work. And for people in society to continue to say that a 17 to 19, and again, a lot of times predominantly African-American athletes that come from areas where they didn't have nothing in the first place. To just, just disregard the fact that literally, hey, we know what this is about. You know what this is about. Which brings me to my next point. The, the, so the question is, people want to know all the time, like, okay, well, why do, why do these athletes think they're going pro? Like, how does that actually work? But the fact of the matter is, do, do the football, as I mentioned earlier, 85, 85 people on a roster, up to 100 in football. So out of that roster, I'm going to talk a little football terms. we talk about two deep. So to educate you guys, two deep means is, again, you're on a first team and a second team. So in football, you got 11 starters on offense, 11 starters on defense. You have your special teams crew, where a lot of times they have the second team guys that go in the actual, um, on the actual field. So because of that, what happens is, like, every player that's on that first team and that second team, I can assure you, a coach spoke to that kid, especially talking about Power 5 universities. When it comes to this school, they talking, you can play in the National Football League. Again, I talk about there are four different types of recruiting when it comes to this situation. One type of recruiting is defensive recruiting. And what that means is you don't want – you recruit me and offer me a scholarship because you don't want me to go to the rival. For example, I'm a Michigan kid, but I'm, I'm – um, uh, Ohio State wants me. Or, 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 or somebody – Michigan State wants me. Or Purdue wants me. You recruit me simply because you don't want me to stay in Michigan. You want to infiltrate or take away recruiting from that area. The next type of recruiting, regional recruiting. You really don't want me to come to your school, but my high school has produced a lot of good players in the past. At the end of the day, you, I am my brother, my cousin. A friend of mine is two classes behind me. My high, your high school coach, the high school coach is looking to move up and leave and get a college job. So you go regionally, you want to basically make a connection. So you offer this kid a scholarship. And sometimes the high school coach a job to get that kid two years from now. When you get that coach out of there, it almost kind of ensures you're going to get that kid in a regional situation. The next type of recruiting, star recruiting. The star recruit is the guy that literally everybody wants. Even if they want him to play or not, because he has this star, it's part of their recruiting class of their media to try to say, hey, we get this guy. We can basically pat ourselves on the back and thump our chest and say, we made it. We the best. We the baddest there is. And you use that kid based off his star to basically continue to build on the future with the next type of guy. And the last type of recruit, obviously, is a recruit that you truly want. The guy that you see basically help moving your program a certain way, helping it build it to go to the next level, um, trying to make sure that actual guy is successful at all, by all costs because at the end of the day, um, this is someone you feel like is going to help you um, move your career along forward too in a lot of these situations when it comes to coaches. Those are the four type of recruiting situations. So out of those 44 guys on the football team, Yes, 44 out of the 100 believe they're going to the National Football League. 44 have been told by their college recruiter that if you come here, you will be playing in the National Football League. When in essence, you might have five or six between that class. The other, the other um, 50, just happy to be there. At the end of the day, they don't play anyway. So what, like Herm Edwards said, like, well, we're going to be cutting scholarships. Well, you might well cut those scholarships for guys that are not going pro, if you will, and then give the guys that's generating the revenue the other 44, the money. Because once again, I talk about education. There are people right now that's going to school tonight. They got to cook dinner for their family. And at the end of the day, they're still making ends meet. So when you have young men have an opportunity to make 50, 60, 70, 100,000, a couple million, and you have all these people saying about education and getting their degree, that they're going to actually bypass an opportunity when their job, again, is dictated on their health and their age. So you're going to let them jeopardize their health and get older to look away from $3 million. That is 
in an education sense, the dumbest thing I have ever heard in my life. And for people to continue to sit there and perpetuate this as it's really education, you have never seen a documentary from any university for one athlete at any level since the time of existence of how their schedule goes from start to finish. And you never will. The people that perpetuate all of this stuff is the one that continue to make money off these athletes and these families. I mean this and I say this with all due respect. So if his coach is looking and watching right now, the NCAA, there is not one parent that I had the pleasure, or not one athlete that had the pleasure to work with at any level that says they enjoy or happy about the university that they attend. Every single one of them will tell you to a man and a woman if they wasn't going to get blackballed or treated a certain way by the fan base or not have their coach defend their, their character. For example, you have all these things that's been said about Jalen Hurts, but all of a sudden I see Nick Saban is going to the White House to see Mr. Donald Trump. He can do that, but he can't address the fact that his starting quarterback that went 25-2 and two helped him win a national championship gets called an N-word every other week. That's not addressed. And people can say all the time, oh, you don't know what Nick is doing, um, you know, individually. I do know what he's doing. That's why I said it. Because you don't know doesn't mean I don't know. I'm the player's rep. Again, the kids and the families are what drive all these things. At the end of the day, if you take those Alabama kids that played and won a national championship and you put them on a Villanova football team, Villanova will have back-to-back -back championships in basketball and football. You could have left Nick Saban in Alabama and nothing would have changed. Sports is not a game. Sports is all business. Regarding Alabama, since, you know, the question was posed about their, their senior class or just their class in general, you got an underclassman named Mickey Fitzpatrick out of New Jersey. Once again, he's, he's the highest rated uh, draft pick on their, on their class this year. But the fact of the matter is, if you talk about how college success equates to the NFL for the University of Alabama, which, again, all these kids are recruited to say, come to Alabama, we present, we provide, and we make pro athletes. These guys talking about how everything is professionally done at Alabama. Once again, you got players year in and year out shooting themselves in the leg, in bars, smoking cigars in the field. They can't answer a sentence. They can't do this. They can't do that. Unfortunately, Mr. Reuben Foster, an Alabama alum, just was drafted last year to 49ers, is now looking at 11 years in prison. 11 years in prison. For domestic violence and assault, who also went to University of Alabama, who also got kicked out of the combine because of his shoulder injury that was nobody knew was there. Technically, Alabama said they didn't know it was there either. That's what they say. Sports is not a game. Sports is all business. Mr. Ruben Foster did all these different things. His, his character was not developed properly. And now once he gets to the pros, when he's making money, now all the same things he's probably been doing years before that was not addressed, now is going to cost him. Before Mr. Foster got arrested for this last incident, he was went back to Tuscaloosa and got arrested for smoking weed again. Sports is not a game. Now, people may say, again, Colin Kaepernick, Ruben Foster, what's the difference? How is that fair not fair? Again, when I talk about sports, I talk about it from a business perspective. The reason why I go so hard and we go so hard regarding the NCAA, because at the end of the day, they're putting out false narratives about his education. At the end of the day, as a former athlete, high school, collegiate, and pro, I know exactly what goes on day to day when it comes to these college kids. For those that are going to go pro and for those that are not going pro, a lot of them experience and deal with the same exact thing. The NFL, on the other hand, is a different, different animal for me. Now, once again, I may not agree with the fact that what the NFL did regarding Colin Kaepernick and them not wanting him to play. However, I go back to a job scenario again. When you go to your job tomorrow and they want you to do something, whether you like it or not, if you want to remain employed there, you have to either do what they ask you to do or seek employment elsewhere. That's the facts. Colin Kaepernick chose to take a knee. I support his right. The thing is, it's his right to take a knee. But also from a business perspective, the fact of the matter, it is the NFL's right to not offer him a job. It's like it's the right of people who don't feel that's right 
to not watch the NFL. But that's what I go back to the business there. It's too many things in sports that are too up for discussion that don't make any sense because, once again, people are not looking at it a certain way. They're looking at it as, well, hey, um, literally, he, he's, a, he's an entertainer. He has to jump, roll, and do what I say when I say do it. And that's not the way it should be. Hold on one second. Can you still hear me, Mr. Hampton? Because I seem like this uh, 